Stop 3. Production and Consumption. Overlooking the River Ooze by the City Screen. You should go down the alleyway off Corny Street alongside the Church of St Martin's to the river. As you have already heard, the people of Ibarakum had access to exotic products from across the vast trade network of the Roman Empire, but many items were also produced closer to home. Food staples like meat and grain were grown in the fields surrounding the town and brought into market. Not far from where you're standing now, there once stood a large warehouse for storing this grain. It would have been brought into York by boat. Excavations here revealed the existence of storage pits and large quantities of charred barley and rye, as well as the remains of millions of grain beetles, a hungry pest which devoured the crops. The remains of animals butchered for their meat have also been found in Roman sites around York. Although beef appears to have been the main meat consumed by the people of Ibarakum, the inhabitants of the city apparently had a varied diet, and the Roman dinner table might have held pork, mutton, venison, rabbit, goose, duck, fish, and even dormouse. Some of the best evidence for butchery taking place on a large scale in Ibarakum was discovered just across the river from here. Standing on the riverbank, you might once have caught the sounds and smells of the butcher's trade drifting over the water. A large number of cattle shoulder blades were found on the site, with holes drilled through the bone. These shoulders of meat would have been hung up to smoke for a period of time before being carved up and sold to the public. The byproducts of butchery would also have played an important role in the industry. Leather, in particular, would have many uses. Now, let us hear from Otha, who represents a shoemaker of Ibarakum. I have to speak to Rufus at the tannery soon about purchasing some more leather. He always has the very best stuff. His suppliers must be skilled butchers, as the hides are always in good condition, without many cut marks. The demand for my shoes has been high of late. Everyone needs shoes, after all. Perhaps if I agree to make some for Rufus and his family, he'll give me a good deal on the leather. Among the Yorkshire Museum's Roman collections is a child's leather shoe. Although leather shoes were worn by the majority of people throughout the Roman Empire, the boy or girl who wore this shoe probably came from a relatively well-to-do family, as it would have been just as expensive to keep buying new footwear for a growing child as it is today. Industry in Ibarakum extended far beyond butchery and leatherwork. The town was alive with craft activity. The streets would have been filled with the sound of clanking hammers and the air filled with smoke from craftsmen's hearths. Entrepreneurs took every opportunity to profit from the markets offered by access to the Roman trading network. Excavations have revealed that there were various manufacture and craft industries in workshops that spread across the city. Some of their produce includes metalwork, leather items and Whitby jet jewellery. Romano-British craftsmen often operated from compact strip buildings. These were simple one-storey buildings, with a small room flanking the street front, which was used for business and shop transactions, and workshop areas and living quarters to the rear. It is likely that there were many of these humble, multifunctional households all over Ibarakum. Ibarakum was a specialist centre for the production of artefacts made from Whitby Jet. Examples of unfinished objects found at various locations around the city are now on display in the Yorkshire Museum. Complete items include jet pins, bracelets, beads and figurines which became especially fashionable in the latter half of the 2nd century AD. As well as producing more ornate personal items, the craftsmen of Ibarakum were responsible for producing mundane everyday items. 
The city had its own pottery industry, producing the famous Eberarkham ware, a grey pottery which was distributed widely across Yorkshire. But potters kept up with empire-wide trends and also mimicked continental styles. Supidia, who represents a potter from the city, will give you an idea of what it might have been like to work in this trade. My father was a potter. He taught me all I know about the craft. I take pride in my work, and am proud of the range of items I can make. I sell plates, bowls, jugs, jars, drinking cups, you name any kitchen or tableware, I can make it. Some of my more ambitious products have included mortaria, which are large basins used for grinding down herbs and spices. I sold a batch to the fish sauce man. I've also recently tried my hand at candlesticks. It's a competitive market, you see. I've got to compete with all of the stylish, fancy pottery, Samian from Gaul, and color-coated ware from the south of Britain. The soldiers prefer these types, as it gives them a taste of home. I know my customers, though. I mainly cater for British locals, who want functional items, but like to keep up with the latest Roman styles at a fair price. Not all production activity was as honest as pottery. It seems that activities could go under the radar of the authorities. Counterfeit Roman coins were produced in Eberarkham, as suggested by the discovery of a mould designed for this purpose. Perhaps some of the local inhabitants were resentful of the burden of Roman tax, so resorted to more devious methods of profiteering. 